All right. So, uh, Sublation Media viewers, uh, guess what? Derek Varn and I are getting married. We we've made up. Today so this would be, be uh, pop the left. What round four? <laughs> Is it round four already? What? Well, there, there's the, there's the, the non barn pop the left, but you know that existed for a little while. So yeah, it didn't do anything. It couldn't. I couldn't get anyone to agree <laughs> to actually be the co-host of Pop the Left. I asked everybody. I, there's some <laughs> German guys I asked. I met them once and said, "Do you want to be pop, part of Pop the Left?" And they're like, "No, never." Um, uh, so I don't know what it is about the position, but uh, it's uh, only you are capable of standing <laughs> up under the tremendous pressure I put on the Pop the Left co-host. Um, we, we, today we're going to be talking about th this split in thinking in Marxism um, between volunteerism and determinism. We read a, we both read an article by a guy named D.P. Costello mm -hmm. um, on an essay. Uh, about that it was written and published in 1961 uh, interestingly what? actually reaches conclusions that are common to the neo kalskius left today um all right yeah i mean uh i was actually reading this and i was like oh this is old i would have suspected this to have come out like you know after lars lee because in the 60s this is actually contrary to, you know, yeah, the new Soviet, left. well, both the new left and Soviet orthodoxy. So right. both. Um, well, tell me how it was. Well, let's let's what do you state what you think the conclusion of the essay was and then how and then explain how it was contrary to the, so, the official Soviet line in 1961. Well. Costello seems to be dealing with uh, a problem that was first noticed by Gramsci, but also was part of the internal debates between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. And the Mensheviks said that um, the Bolsheviks were way too voluntaristic. They both condemned the Analexia, but also used them um, and also expanded the conception of who was part of the dictatorship of the proletariat formally to the dictatorship of the proletarian peasant. Um, so that they were violating Marxist orthodoxy. The, the Leninist response was no, we weren't. The merger thesis is actually implicit in Marxism. Um, it's implicit in Marx. That's why Marx talks about the advanced sections of the proletariat as something kind of specific of which socialists can join. Mm -hmm. um, it's implicit in, Kals in Kalski as well. Um, and we can't, we haven't done the development. We're actually going to have to build something like state capitalism ourselves which remember, like I've talked to you about this in the past, George A. Pokhanov was afraid of that and afraid of Incan development, but it led the Marxists into this weird position, very similar to the uh, to the Social Democrats under Hilferding during the Weimar period, where they were advocating for increased bourgeoisification of society to develop forces so that a revolution could happen mm -hmm. uh, this tendency also actually is in uh debates in the uh 20 years later actually it's happening in the 1920s the one side wins 20 years later in the in the communist party in china um when they're arguing actually against Maring, who is the diplomat sent by the ussr to the nascent commandant at the end of the 1920s um that maybe they need to adopt something like a proletarian nascent thesis to succeed the way Lenin did, um, thus incorporating uh, non-comprador bourgeoisie and whatever into their socialist developmental project and also being the legions with the peasants, which they had gotten from Lenin as well. Um, mm. So they, the idea with the peasants was to... Um, create a bourgeois class out of the peasantry no no not at all no, no okay well, then the idea was that the that the peasantry was part of the laboring class and that 
if they were incorporated but subsumed un, in the dictatorship of the bourgeois, that they would basically be proletarianized but under state capitalist conditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the bourgeois. So, who was the bourgeois class in by Russia? The, yeah, and in, in their own by their own conception. Uh, the bourgeois class was in, in the Russian conception of things actually a very small class aligned to the aristocrats and the czar. And then technically the liberal end of the provisional government would have also been seen as fundamentally bourgeois. But they, but their own aim was to develop capitalism and the, and bourgeois culture, right? Well, not so much bourgeois culture. They thought they could like, one of the things about Lenin's kind of development that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around is Lenin agreed with Plakhanov that there was going to be no way for the Russians to piggyback on capitalism in Europe, but use peasant communes that had developed in Russia in the 19th century. um, And that were part of its historical system, actually going back to even their feudal position uh, as a way to develop communism without going through a capitalist phase. Marx and Engels went back and forth on whether or not this is possible. In the end of the letters uh, to Vera Zulik and then on Engels' writing later, they kind of take a middle position that, no, they couldn't have done it without capitalism having happened in Europe. But now that capitalism has happened in Europe, if they do it at the right time, mm-hmm. um, the peasants would be able to use the technologies and socialization techniques developed in the capitalist world uh, to bypass capitalist development. Plakhanov rejected that. I don't, uh, it's unclear if he knew Marx's position on this because these were mostly in letters, but there were people influenced by Marx that argued this in the Russian sphere. Um, and Plakhanov was like, that's just not going to happen here. Um, the, the peasantry so will be to, too weak. Just to mm-hmm. clarify, and, and you can tell me I'm wrong if, if I would appreciate it. If I am wrong, I want you to tell me. But my understanding of why the development of capitalism was necessary in order to achieve socialism is because you wanted to create a mass production, um, not only in order to create consumer goods and, and, you know, have the, this material wealth available, but also in order to socialize right. the productive forces of the country, which means that you bring people together to work collectively um, and to uh, far outpace the kind of production that they could have done separated off into their private farms. and Which is why farms. the industrialization of the working class is actually important to this thesis, because it is it is the shop factory which breaks up trade guild uh, skills carteling that allows social production to be semi, what I would call semi-skilled, what many people might call unskilled, uh, meaning that you have skills that you develop on the job, but there's no craft or guild trade because your specific p- part of production is so small. Um, you know, it's operating this one machinery or fixing this one lever even. Um, mm-hmm. That most anybody who can be educated at a basic level, get basic literacy, can do it. And so this also, like, you're right to point this out because the developmentalist thesis picked up by the modes of production thesis in the Soviet Union, which became Soviet doctrine, is actually more akin to second international Marxism than people like to admit. Mm -hmm. Um, And what it talks about is the, all the social reinvestment and infrastructure end of this, but it does not talk about the socialization end of this relations of production aren't considered all that crucial in the Soviet period. And in this way, they actually sound a lot more like, say, the Hilferding Social Democrats. This is big under Stalin and actually leads to, uh, during the Khrushchev and Brezhnev period, the Maoists critiquing, although in, ironically in the name of Stalin, Stalin's own position, <laughs> um, this refusal to deal with socialization um and relations of production and thus like thus instigating all the capitalist voters within the uh Chinese Communist Party. Now that always seemed to me weird when I studied because I I went through this backwards. I studied China first. 
Um, I didn't understand what they were responding to was all these, not just Bernsteinian socialists, which we know about, we know about the revisionist, but also that basically developmentalism under both Hilferding and separately under late Lenin becomes kind of official Soviet doctrine, but not like Soviet doctrine though, is that it will automatically lead to industrialization and industrialization will automatically lead to these social productive schemas. So we don't have to worry about it. It's unclear that that's what actually happened. All right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Just to, just to, I want to clarify what was just said. So there's this division between industrializing a nation Mm -hmm. Meaning investing in enough work to produce machinery and Correct. mining and steel and you know and and, and technology, um, and the the aim of proletarianization, which is not just to create the right kinds of machines, but to bring enough people into the working class and create um, a mass mass production uh, that way. Is that the division between? You know, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you could think of it as mo like modes of production theory, which is actually popular. Um, and it makes some sense that they wouldn't focus on this in mm -hmm. industrial capitalism. This is one of the things Bernstein actually is sort of right about when he points out, hey, we've always thought that we could just take over democratically and then have a defensive war. Um from like the Erfurt program, that's the second program of the SP Day forward. Mm -hmm. Um, because we thought that the industrial proletariat and the industrial part of that's actually important, um, would be more would be majority of the population because the majority of the population would be proletarianized. What actually happened and what burnt what leads Bernstein into his revisionism is he notices that they never reach um, capacity of industrial proletarianization that they think. They never actually achieve the dominant position of society. The, the peasantry, even when we're talking the early 20th century, isn't even totally gone away with. And in so much that it is, it isn't necessarily going into industrial labor. It's not needed there even. Um, Where's it going? Agricultural labor that's owned some is going to agricultural labor, some is going to small shop streets. A lot of it becomes the perpetual, the perpetual semi employed or like gig working poor of Germany, would be our current analogy of it. And it becomes a lot of the base for the fascists, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, if you look at the social bases, uh, uh, according to Kevin Passmore, the working class that was, was steadily employed tended to be in the SP day the working class and the reserve army of labor, uh, which I also interestedly tended to be in more immigrant Jewish and Catholic parts of, of the German country tended to favor the communist and mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of semi-employed uh, you know, kind of petit bourgeois, maybe kind of lump in using classical Marxist categories uh uh, but what we would call the working poor became a lot of the mass base of fascism um, with elements of the of various parts of the working class siding with them at different times. Mm -hmm. So, OK, there's that. OK, so let me let me recapitulate this so I know I'm on the same page with you. So um, th to go back to what the topic of the essay is about, the, the split between voluntarism and determinism. Um, the the Leninist and then Stalinist um, approach to this question and um, was not to be so focused on industrialization uh, as a something that was happening through the development of the working class, but rather to seek uh, state power politically and organize um, the workers as a political force. And revolutionary right. force, right? Um, and the 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 complaint from the Mensheviks would be that you know if you uh, basically that you're not going to succeed in overcoming um, either the czar or the bourgeois state 
uh, through this kind of political project. Is that what the Mitchell right. would have said? Right. That you that you might you might win against the czar, but you're going to have to go through bourgeoisification yourself. And Plakhanov was very worried about. But um, but it seems to me Lenin accepted that, right? You've yeah, just he, said that. Lenin yeah, he accepted did accept that. it that, but he mm-hmm. kind of thought that the gamble. Well, so here's the important thing to remember when you read State and Revolution and mm-hmm. why this changes. Mm-hmm. The Russian Revolution and Lenin's success in the Russian Revolution is predicated primarily on in the conflicts of the workers and, and soldiers' councils in Germany after the Kaiser falls, mm-hmm. that Germany ends up in the socialist camp. However, um, the the Soviets in Germany are defeated. The Bavarian mm-hmm. Soviet falls, for example. Uh, the German Revolution ends up in kind of a, a mixed revolution. Okay, It ends up being a liberal revolution, getting rid of the last vestiges of um, Kaiserism. Right. Um, and the old semi-feudal parts of the Bismarckian state. But what it does not do is social Democrats end up having to uh, coalesce with nationalist forces, um, and they end up in league with bourgeois forces, and at first in kind of a loyal opposition position, and then later as actually governing the country, often in coalition with liberal parties. Mm-hmm. All right. That wasn't supposed to happen. That fundamentally divides uh, European social democracy. And it also, as I was mentioning with the Chinese, right, because example, now they're they're looking after their own nation's interest as a and competing with other workers in other countries who are also right. to be on the and the having the same political project despite right. national borders. Is that Yes, exactly. And this leads to a debate, even in places like China. So there's a, the, uh, before Mao comes to power, Mao is still basically a student who's part of the um, what the you know what would become the basis of the anti-Japanese forces. At this time, it's just kind of the nationalist forces uh, uh, in the lieu of the warring states, uh, war in, well, the warlord period of of early China, and with the Queen's te- uh, when the Qing Dynasty is technically still around, but barely, and then right after when it falls. Um, and the Guomindong comes into power. These debates actually happen in China too, kind of a little later, but before um okay. Well, I want to like when you say that wasn't supposed to happen, that wasn't supposed to happen according to Lenin's conception, right? It wasn't supposed to happen according to the classical social democratic conception either. Right. Basically, but after would you say that the Mensheviks would have been okay with this because they were they were talking about creating bourgeois democracies that would last 100 years according to this essay we read. Yeah, no, they and thought that it was a long gonna, array project. Yeah. But if you do that then you're going to accept the division of the working class. Right. At that at that point. And so and the, the Mensheviks had also nation. yeah well, so here's how what I'm telling you is how Lenin could claim to be orthodox with state and revolution um, because he's still depending on mm-hmm. the the crisis of World War One. And even though the, you know, the, the social Democrats are turncoats for what they actually did um, mm-hmm. with the, you know, with the Ebert and all that, mm-hmm. um, which he, of course, blames Kowski for. And we've talked about how Kowski. He's kind of to blame, but really did like he actually leaves the party because of right. um, he doesn't support the war credits really either. Um, but that's the first division. Well, the second division is the communist and the radical parts of the social democrats lose mm-hmm. um in the German Revolution. Now the Mensheviks were trying to say, look, we don't need Germany. Mm-hmm. We can develop a hundred-year bourgeois project here to develop the forces and and socialization project. We can do it without using high state intervention and it being particularly brutal. That's what Plukhanov was worried about, Mm -hmm. right, was the brutality of trying to force uh, developmentalism through very quickly through a state project. And Mm -hmm. he he had Which is not what was always done. You know, right. But that <laughs> you know? is, I mean, ironically, that is how it it 
was done with the possible exception of the Italian city states and in England itself. Um, and while that was in England, you know, the I don't know, the uh, it seems like the what it was the enclosure movement mm -hmm. was pretty brutal, you know, maybe not as brutal as it's not as brutal as when you're forcing uh, industrialization on people very quickly, yeah. Um, I think with with England, you also have the the additional complication of it's an imperial power during its industrialization movement. No other country, not even France. France is also kind of an imperial power. Yes. So you can rely on these foreign goods that you're basically right. stealing, the primitive accumulation to tide tide you, you over as you slowly and to soften the blow to your you know to the local population. Mm. Um, whereas. Uh, in Germany, it was slow, and it's also a massive state project. But there, uh, Russia is trying to do this with you know without any additional imperial accumulation, and so they think it has to be a long durée project because mm -hmm. there's no way to soften it for them. All this um, talk is making me feel like uh, you know I'm pretty I'm like warming up to the Mensheviks now. This is not good. We, now we're going way off the rails here. That's not orthodox. Go ahead. Um, um, well, I mean, the Mensheviks betrayed themselves when they uh, with many of them signing to the right to the, like, they fight with the white army. I mean, you can't forget right. that. Yeah. Right. Um, but Plakhanov's worries make sense. All right. Mm. So we mentioned three spears and I think part of the confusion for people is like, this is all happening between 1900 and 1930. And I've mentioned three completely separate spears of, uh, of socialist debate. We've talked about Germany. We've talked about Russia, Russia and China. And we've talked about China. All right. Mm -hmm. China. Uh, one of the first leads of the, uh, of the communist party of China before Mao Li comes up with a new thesis out of this that also gets replicated by the fascist, which is the idea of proletarian nationhood. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you start getting real deviations from any attempt at, uh, at orthodoxy that comes mm -hmm. in in China um, In Russia, you have a problem. And the problem is Lenin's claim to orthodoxy is based off after the period of revolutionary defeatism, um, the you know they the proletariat in uh, and the and actually the farmers and the soldiery rebel against the Kaiser in their loss, um, and in theory, that should lead off to them having a national revolution. And now you have a productive part of the core for them to join up with. So you kind of have like the synthesis in Lenin of the Plakhanov and the classical, uh, you know, and the kind of the classical Marxist prediction that you could kind of, you know, piggyback on the capitalist world. Lenin isn't phrasing it like that. He, he kind of mm. sees that as non-viable. And like I said, these letters of, of Marxists aren't really well known at this time period. We don't know how many people in Russia had read them. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, I want to insert a thought here. Just the normal way that I, at least the way I used to think about this, this division between volunteerism and determinism was very simple. And it was very much in the context of the contemporary left, whether it was 2008 or uh, 2020, or, you know, mm -hmm. it was always, um, how are we going to create a socialist project? Are we going to try to propagandize the working class and get them to volunteer based on our ideas? Or are we going to wait and for the, for capitalism itself to create conditions which motivate workers to whatever those conditions are, right? Immiseration right. is acceleration, right. is, etc. And it, I always thought that immiseration was sort of um, a key component of the determinist position. But when the way we've been talking, in fact, it's the opposite that you could be a determinist and think that it's going to be the hyper productivity and socialization that capitalism brings that will create conditions for socialism to take hold not an iteration right i'm going to say something that makes your purest marxist heart 
recoil. Okay. Marx has inconsistent theories on this. Right. Um, maybe there is a grand unifying theory that I'm not seeing, but in the mm. 1850s, he's an immiserationist, or at least very close. In the 1860s, he is not. And part of what seems to be driving uh, capitalism is like a, a, like capitalism and capital as his critique of political economy and capitalism is explaining why the immiserationist theory may still partly be true, but not in the way that he thought in the 1850s, like that there was just going to be a, a simple overthrow of capitalism in this early stage, which he did predict in his letters. Um, right. And then you well, have it's kind to... of a, I can see a common way you kind of combine the two. It's like you say, okay, we bring all the workers together. They create massive amounts of wealth. The, the, the nation is industrialized and proletarianized or the all, or the, the world is say, mm -hmm. and then due to the contradictions in capitalism, there's this immiseration, but you already have the, the, the proletarian class in, in not only, in places, workers, but also politicized and members of the party, and ready to uh, right. be revolutionary. And and interestingly, what you get actually here is a more acute uh, observation than the simple immiseration thesis. Like, mm -hmm. well, we know from history that just because things get harder doesn't mean people actually rebel. In fact, sometimes it seems like it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. If you take that version. Of the immiseration thesis, where the proletariat sees more and more of its wealth being built and gathered, mm -hmm. has the capacity to control it, but has no access to it. Mm -hmm. Like that is slightly, I, I mean, I think a more uh, defensible version of the immiseration thesis that is not ruled out by how we see actual revolutions happen. And that may be what Marx was getting at. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue. Uh, becomes kind of crucial when you're trying to understand where all these other classes fit in. Because one of the things that you have to deal with, with, with even Marx himself, and Marx is aware of this, he talks about this in the manifesto, talks about proletarianization of other classes and of individuals who see their interest in the proletariat. Meaning that he does not have a simple mechanistic uh, your class position totally determines your individual oh, consciousness right. rule, right. which also means that he always allowed for people from outside of the working class to be key players in, but not dominant of um, a working class socialist movement. And in fact, it is whether or not he sees the socialist and the workers as the same thing actually does vary in his writing depending mm -hmm. on the time period, depending on the group he's talking about. Um, and this leads to what Kofsky, you know, came up with, which is now called by people like Matt Magnair as the merger thesis, mm -hmm. which you need the advanced part of the proletariat, put an asterisk on advanced because it's not defined. And this is one of the things the new left and the Marxist humanists play with. Um, yeah, they mean the most oppressed. Right. The they mean the most oppressed. Um, it's pretty clear that Marx means the most aware and educated parts of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. um, by that, we don't necessarily mean formally educated. We just kind of mean right smart. No, right. They could be <laughs> the, the people who are most political. The most the political most are the most probably skilled. urban. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, that's what he means by that's what he probably means by advanced. But again, it's not actually clearly stated in any text. So. Um, we but can think for ourselves a little bit. How about that? I mean, right. that? That sounds like a good idea. The most advanced wouldn't be the ones who went to Harvard, but they would be the ones that, um, you know, were, could were read. engaged in politics, could read, yeah, and and who have um, actually probably enough material support that they um, can organize and, and, and have time to bring people together. Right. That's the idea is they'll be kind of provisional leaders – um, in this movement, and they can intersect and overlap with socialist thinkers who may or may not come from the proletariat, but who see their interest in the proletariat. That's the idea. 
Kowski kind of formulates this in the road to power. Now, the, it, when Mark McNair, uh, Mike McNair, not Mark McNair, Mike McNair wrote his book about 20 years ago now, Revolutionary Strategy, he deems this the merger thesis. All right. Mm. Um, the problem with the merger thesis in Russia is mm -hmm. that both the intellectia and, and the, the, intellig the intelligentsia, yeah, the, the, yeah, um, and the um, proletariat are small are parts of the population. They're tiny. They're tiny. Right. There's a, there's a bit more proletariat than intelligentsia, maybe, but yeah. So um, you have to include the peasants in this, and you have to include the soldiers in this. And soldiers are a whole another part and problem in Marxist thinking that most people don't even deal with. But right, I mean, but it, the, when we say we have to include the peasants and the soldiers in this, what we're talking about now is um, politically, right? I yeah, mean, it is. There's, there's a, still a split here between like the kind of conditions that you need in order to create a political force, and um, the kind of uh, political force you need to have a revolution. Right. And this is where the volunteerism stuff really comes, comes to play. Right. Mm -hmm. Is the proletariat necessarily solitarily and autonomously the universal class or can some other classes because of specific local interest be involved with them now what is interesting about this is even when Lenin is still part of social democracy and you don't have a Menshevik Bolshevik split and you don't have the separation of the communist um and the communists left from the social democrats they're all still factions in the social democrats that there is a push for in Russia in specific the idea of the dictatorship of the peasants and proletariat with the proletarian attaining the greater role. Um, and that the Mensheviks do not... Now, is this a post-revolutionary push for the dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasants, or mm -hmm. is this... Yeah. Yeah, so it's, you know, so after the revolution, it's basically the party rules in the interest of a coalition of the quote laboring classes of which the peasants are one of according to this theory mm -hmm. um and because of the developmental phase of russia as they enter this they the peasants have to be included the mensheviks you know eventually and as the article points out they're not consistent on this either Polkanov goes both directions mm -hmm. um yeah but when you talk about what i remember from the essay to go to the costello for a bit is that when he's talking about Plekhanov, he's not really specifically. He doesn't quote Plekhanov on the peasants. No, he quotes Plekhanov on the need for intelligentsia to bring um, uh, socialist ideas to workers. And right. Plekhanov has it both ways there. But I don't remember him. I, you well, know, the question of the peasantry is... was in there, but it wasn't in there quite the way we're talking about it. No, in, I in, mean, well, like... part of the the problem is that. Marxists have always kind of tried to have it both ways. It's unclear to me, even when Marx himself, right, when you compare what Marx does in the First International versus what he writes in Capital, if Marx's actions line up with what Capital implies. Mm -hmm. um, Antonio Gramsci, who I'm not always the biggest fan of, mm -hmm. does pick up on this tension himself in later writings when he, uh, which in an essay that gets called, it's a very short essay, like it gets called popularly Lenin versus capital mm -hmm. versus Das capital. Um, and it's really about this question. All right. Is Lenin proving something like volunteerism true? Is there a third thing, which is where Gramsci's like hegemonic humanism comes in? Mm -hmm. um, or is it, you know, is there a way in which, Lenin has actually disproved capital itself by having a successful revolution in a place where under conditions described in Das Kapital and under the understanding of the Goethe program, uh, the critique of the Goethe program and of um, uh, the understanding of, you know, the manifesto should not have happened, right? Like, now, that, to, to claim that last thing, I think you'd have to take it for granted or as an assumption that 
socialism of some kind had been achieved in the Soviet Union, wouldn't you? Yeah, but yeah, everybody who was a socialist did. Right. Like, right, except for Lenin, you know, I mean, or or Stalin, de depending on the day, like they would talk about how um, they hadn't achieved the dictatorship of the proletariat, or they would talk about how they hadn't um, created a transitionary period yet. That you know, they they knew yeah. that their aim was to. Create Lenin never conditions. says that they get past the transitionary period. Uh, Stalin moves right. the goalpost all over the fucking place, right? Like, um. Just like it, like you, if you were to ask, like the Ch a Chinese communist now in the Communist Party who's educated on communist doctrine, but on the like introductory civic classes that you're likely to get in China, uh, uh, you probably would hear them say they haven't achieved, uh, but the earliest bits of socialism, much less communism. Um, right. The, but under Stalin, that goalpost moves dramatically and stuff gets right. redefined all the time. Right. But Under, I just wanted to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not blaming Gromsky there. I'm just saying like, we should be clear. We don't have to make those same, same assumptions today. That, and just no, I mean, clearly I think you can't like, right, right. Uh, like you cannot say, even though there is a tendency of people to try to mm -hmm. that, that, that the USSR succeeded. And in fact, right. the entire question of all the divisions in most of the Western and world left really is on when you think the USSR betrayed itself. Mm -hmm. And I am increasingly of the position that it's from moment one. Um, yeah, but I think that's even the wrong way to frame it, because to say that it betrayed itself is to claim to make the claim like, oh, well. It's almost a plus. Well, they could have done better. You know, they knew better. No, know? I mean, that's my, right. that's actually my point. Yeah. When they attempted to do state development of capital, all right, mm -hmm. and they saw that it didn't work, and mm -hmm. then they brought in uh, Bukharin, who is a guy I, I actually generally respect, but he is the origin, the originator of the concepts of socialism in one country, that Bukharin mm -hmm. brings in, okay, we have to keep these peasants in the coalition because we need the food. We haven't industrialized this sector yet. Um, how do we bring them into the fold and proletarianize them without totally losing it? And he says, to reintroduce markets. Right. Like, um, right. Uh, you know, at different levels of society. That's his answer. Um, ironically, it's sort of a, okay, well, part of the Menshevik critique is right. <laughs> um, so, right. You know, and that's why he's considered the right opposition is because his his answer, even though he actually comes out of out of the left wing of the Bolsheviks um, with Lenin rep representing the center, he ends up saying, OK, we, we have to do some internal development. We can't collectivize. It'll be a disaster. We'll have to force people. And the reason they couldn't collectivize is because they didn't have the productive capacity to provide for an industrial sector without um without relying on the peasants who were not socialized to work collectively um in, in a productive way they were they were right. still stuck in the old um peasant mode of production right so you couldn't you couldn't move them along fast enough and they were the only ones who could grow the food it wasn't like right. you could import it from somewhere right in the meantime or yeah I mean, one of the things you notice about capitalist economies is that even though food is crucial to the basic functioning of a capitalist economy, you're not out of food, you don't exist anymore. But it's like, um, ironically, Bordiga, uh, I'm, I'm going to go Bordiga called this, that once you get down to, once it in a developed capitalist uh, country that you could even pretend to socialize, that the amount of economic activity attached to food is like 2%, which is about what it is for us. Right. Um, uh, but he calls us really early. Now, you know, I got my problems with Bordiga, but there's stuff like that that he's actually pretty apt on. Um, right. The So you're in this ironic position from our vantage point. Like if we're jumping from here, we have to say, OK, well, this worked if your goal was to get rid of the peasantry and bourgeoisify the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it absolutely did not work. Um as a means of developing socialism, unless you're going to believe that like there's a 500 year transition possible in China or something. Um, right. Okay. Right. Which but interestingly then you have a lot enough, of explaining. Is, you, yeah. You have to do a lot of explaining at that point. And um, 
And are you determinist or volunteerist at this? But this is what it, like part of well, my you're thing. Determinist. Is, I think you're determinist. Is all these volunteerists flip to determinist when this fails? Right. Like, um, and yeah, one of the things that they, they all try, become Mensheviks, basically. Yeah, basically, like, and and sometimes politically disastrously. Like, like if you look at what, for example, that the Marxist Leninist Communist parties in Latin America and in France and in Italy actually advocated, they were sometimes to the right of the socialists, all right, mm -hmm. because of these assumptions. Um, and then the Maoist and Trotskyists, and I'm using that word here advisedly, I know they call themselves different things, mm -hmm. but they were, they were, one was the anti Stalin, but we're going to save Lenin, and one is the pro Stalin, but we're going to condemn the Soviet Union um approach to this problem as a critique <laughs> like they're like look um either you were wrong about volunteerism in which case why did we ever just not stay on the path of social democracy in the first place that's unacceptable for those of us in the developing world therefore we must believe that the political determinism the determinism and i use volunteerism political yeah, political yeah. volunteerism, which is interesting. Th this is what part of what's confusing is when we use the term political determinism, we actually mean volunteerism because it means right. you politics voluntarily determines social conditions. That's what right. that means. Um, right. That the political and, it, it, and here, let me start, just to bracket this stuff said, and it does within mm -hmm. limits, right? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> like it has, we feedback. have to believe that's the, the truth that or else why organize politically at all to change the conditions of society? Why? You know what I mean? We have to think right. that the choices well, I mean, we make the will ultimate, shape our future. Yeah, the ultimate yeah. answer of that when you get that up is Bernsteinism, which is we don't need to um, actually organize oh, politically. So why we, even enter the parliament then? You know, why, right. why, you know, like why, why we, we can be the more as socialists, we can be more, the more responsible capitalist is a Bernsteinian answer because we yeah, know well, what just, this is ultimately why not building. Why an entrepreneur, to. which is my solution. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> right. Well, it, it, I mean, all these, to me, what you get into, I mean, you, you were talking about your, your frustration with this article is like, Oh, this doesn't really answer the question. It just kind of like the Caputo Argo, article to get kind of to the end of it it's with the baby it says no the Menshevists were white but not right about russia because russia had unique conditions which lenin yeah. was correct for which i think is intellectually defensible in 1961 it is not intellectually defensible after 1992 right like yeah um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's at least, yeah, you can see it. It's not right in 1961. It's, it's wrong in 1961, but it's, you can see why it's not like an uh, absurd. Right. Make that claim. And it, this guy Costello was interesting because he was, you know, he was charged with being a Soviet spy. Mm. Did you know that? I looked no, him I up. On, I think it, I think I'm um, uh, right here. I looked him up on Wikipedia to make, find out more about him. Um. Uh, Desmond Patrick Costello, born mm -hmm. 1912, died 1964, New Zealand-born linguist, soldier, diplomat, and university lecturer and professor who has nope, been yep. accused of being a KGB agent. Yep. So so we are reading uh, KGB propaganda written by a spy trying to destroy our way of life, Derek. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a dirty Kiwi spy at that. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but the worst kind is New Zealanders. <laughs> you can't trust those hobbit loving socialists. <laughs> I know. Um, I know. But, no. Uh, but no, I mean, it's to me the problem of the determinism problem is is exactly because you have the immiserationist answer to it, and you have developmental forces answer to it. Lenin actually does kind of like he. I, we talked about this when we talked about the theory of imperialism. That's actually a, him trying to work out those contradictions. Mm -hmm. All right. He's trying to intellectually, as well as kind of empirically work out. Okay. Um, we have this immiseration tendency. We have this accumulation tendency. We have what Marx says about the stockholders and the, and the socialization of stockholding is actually being a foundation of communism because it's like the structuralization of capitalism can be useful for that. Uh, mm. Engels and Marx both talk about it and social and, and, uh, 
uh, social uh, socialism and utopian and scientific, which leads you to believe we need to develop the productive forces. We need capitalism to reach a certain amount of abstractification. But mm-hmm. then you have all this immiserationist stuff. Well, how can they both be true? And he's like, imperial competition um, mm-hmm. is what's going to drive this. That's going to be also a way to get rid of uh, overproduction. And, you know, ca- like... And we seize in on this through national development, which actually does lead the Soviet Union to uniquely have a focus uh, both on internationalism, but on nationalism itself as a modernizing project. Right. So that's part of Lenin's like Lenin's, we might say, galaxy brain now attempt to deal with these different tendencies and ideas and Marx is thought by like, okay, how can these, what is the contradiction in which both these things that we see in Marx that he's observing can be true? That the immiseration of, of the proletariat is part of its radicalization, or at least the crisis of capital is part of the, uh, are the proletariat's Right. No, and that, I mean, gotta remember, immiseration, um, for at least I think we should read Marx's immiseration thesis as being about um, not wealth, mm-hmm. but value or the, the, right. the decreasing uh you know the mo- it might it appears a, a financial crisis or what have you but it's not going to be that you just are sitting on a desert and don't have enough food that's not the immigration thesis we're talking about we're talking right. about when you're dumping milk down the drain because it, the price is too low and it's more cost effective to do that we're talking about these irrationalities to create immigration right, right? yeah mm-hmm. i think we are and i i think that's Part of the problem with the immiseration thesis is like the acceleration thesis. It also is a lot vaguer, than, like depending on by just throwing that around by what you mean by it. Yeah, you um, have to say a lot more than just the word in order to. Really, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is true for imperialism, too. Like mm-hmm. I I, uh, I often talk about how people will throw these concepts around. But when you actually ask them to define it, they're actually moving between different definitions that can't both be true. Yeah. Yeah. What this is. Yeah. Um, uh, so. With the miseration, there's a simple form of miseration thesis, which is obviously wrong and even leads to reaction. Um, then there's a more complicated form of it. And you see in some of them like Grossman, who didn't think he was in a miseration thesis, by the way. He thought it was a crisis thesis, but whatever, you know, right, whatever. Yeah. Um, which I like. I like that better. I like the word crisis better. Um but even he thought that like Marx hadn't saw the countervailing variables and what could buy capitalists more time. Mm-hmm. Um, this Seems has awesome. led people like Andrew Kleiman to just attack him as being anti-Marxist a, because he's an immiserationist and Kleiman thinks immiserationism is pro fascist, but also uh, in co- correcting Marx. Now Grossman actually, well, well when Kleiman, says in the miseration thesis is pro-fascist what does he why would he say that what's his argument there um that historically speaking in times of crises like the 1940s uh when a socialist revolution didn't happen some other force steps in now i've been watching opinion polls right now and Mm -hmm. uh I hate to tell everyone this whole Overton window socialism got more popular when in August of, of 2022 Pew did a, uh, how do we feel about socialism and, um, capitalism and interestingly opposition to capitalism increased, but so did opposition to socialism. Well, they're right now they're almost equated in the minds of a lot of people. Right. Well, when, and you know what, if you just listen to our conversation, there's reasons why that's the case. Right? That is, there uh, is reasons why that's the case. And by the yeah. way, the German fascists seized in on this by blaming the Jews specifically mm-hmm. on both capitalism and communism for disrupting the communal German ways of life. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 You know, that, it's an, I, 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 I don't, I'm not always like fascism is around the cold around the corner because I don't think we should think everything bad is fascist. But well, so that's why climate says it. It's just because he looks back on the historical. I, yeah, well, that's what he told impressive. me. I mean, like, again, I could be misrepresenting him. He hates my guts almost yeah. as much as he hates yours. I don't um, know. I haven't talked to him in a while, but I suspect he still hates me. He's, yes. He's, um, it's an elephant. Um, uh, mind. I, but, I've listened to his podcast though. And this whole, 
ironically, their position ends up being the same as like the CPUSA 10 years ago, that we have to maintain kind of the center, the center of the Democratic Party because they're going to be the responsible stewards through capitalism. Um, this old, the, the Menshevik line. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know, which also the Marxist Leninist and the CPUSA have maintained uh, from from basically the popular front period in 1937 all the way to like 2016, 17, um, and maybe returning to now. So, but you know, when, when I, I just say this, when I was involved with climbing on a, you know, pretty much almost daily basis or weekly basis, mm -hmm. he really did emphasize that he thought that there was a need for revolutionary transformation and not that it would, that he, and he didn't think that just managing capitalism could be the aim. No, um, I, I think he would still say he believes in revolutionary transformation, but that managing capitalism is what the responsible person does until the advanced sections of the proletariat start revolution. And by the advanced sections, if you are if you read Rhoda Donoskaya and not Kleiman, but it's pretty clear because both sects of Marxist humanists in the United States believe this, that it's going to be basically the proletarian of color that lead the revolution. Yeah, but why? Because they're the because most they're oppressed. the most immiserated. Right. <laughs> okay, right. Wait a minute. <laughs> and right. notice uh, that. Uh, and notice that in America, you know, they're part of the Democratic Party, but you know, people of color, black people in America are often conservative you know I, that, that, according to uh I'm, I'm just going to give you objective facts to back you up so people can't at, uh, yeah. at you about this according <laughs> to pew mm -hmm. um democrats of color have a more negative view of the progressive wing of the democratic party yet remain in it than any other group mm -hmm. uh they increasingly do not identify as progressives are even liberals mm -hmm. um and that's actually increased since the Floyd revolt. Um, mm -hmm. But they have not abandoned the Democratic Party, which tells you a lot, I think. Um, but something because they think that the other party, the Republican Party, is outright racist against them. And I think and not right. they, they see it as a, as, a, as, a, as a racial party. And then the, so they are stuck as a, as a conservative wing. Now, there's also. If you want to add another variable to this, age does dramatically change this opinion. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, so people under the age of 35 tend to still have a fairly um, progressive. high view of progressives and, and, and the left. People over the age of 35 don't. But even that seems to be slipping. Um, I would say... Look, right I'm going to say something in a minute because I think we should. We're we're at 53 minutes. I want to um I want to go for another 40 or so uh, in the parrot room. So I'm going to save what I'm about to say for the parrot room. Okay, mm -hmm. but but uh, instead I'm just going to say I enjoy this conversation. I think we should wrap it up by saying that I after reading Costello, there's not a solution for the volunteerism determinism split, but there's a rethinking of it. And and for me. And especially after this conversation with you, Derek, what I have to say is that you're never just taking the determinist side. You're never yeah. just taking the volunteerist side. It's always just a matter of like what the total narrative is going to be that that you are embracing. So, for instance, just to clarify what I mean, um, if you think that it uh, that you can create a revolution in Russia in the early 20th century. Um, you're going to say that your that revolution is possible through voluntaristic means, right? Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're going to say, and therefore socialism can be achieved overnight, because it, they thought that you had to then create the conditions for socialism within that they could do it after the revolution more easily than anybody else could do it, but that, that you still had to create conditions for socialism, right? And so the question about this might be, do we think we have to create the conditions for socialism before we have a revolution? Or do we think that the revolution comes first and then we create the the, the uh, conditions for socialism? Um, I think that that might be the better way to split this volunteerism versus determinism debate. What do you think? I think 
that what that evolves into is the prefiguration postfiguration debates, which is a debates that really happened in the fifties and sixties. Like they're not framed that way. Yeah, the, because the prefiguration is all about creating conditions for socialism before right. you have the revolution, right? And by the way, communization theory is also about that, creating are are creating conditions for socialism before, during, and after the revolution. So like kind of all three. Um, that's why it's called communization thesis uh, is bad and because it no longer sees um, that if the proletarian ever was, it isn't anymore the universal class um, for which, you know, classless society can be attained because of either it never was or um, secular stagnation and capitalist decadence has led to atomization. You no longer have the 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 social connections of the industrial shop floor. Deindustrialization means that we are overripe for that form of revolution, and we need something else. Those are kinds of the where this evolves. Um, interestingly, now mm-hmm. I think we are kind of oddly back at square one Mm -hmm. because under like except for the most rabid dingest right now almost nobody sees any uh, of you know highly developed power uh what i would call all of them capitalist in some way and so would you but maybe our audience says and i'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt Mm -hmm. um they see no highly developed power in the position to develop outside of their own borders and within them a socialist program. And so what you see now is volunteerism may even mean, um, it means so many different things that when we talk about it as just merely having socialist intellectuals propagandize um, the working class, the working class are merged with the working class or whatever. Um, and again, the merger thesis is kind of having it both ways, in my opinion, but that's, mm-hmm. you know, that's what it tends to do. Um, that now we're talking about, like, well, can we bring about socialism by weakening the hegemonic capitalist power, even if we're talking about other capitalist forces? Can we bring about for socialism by capitalist-like developmental plans out of a nominally socialist government that doesn't even think that it's achieved socialism? Um, mm-hmm. Can we bring about socialism through collapse? And, uh, you know, one of the communization theses is, is that collapse will be the socializing force since industry wasn't. Like, so what because the UFOs will show up after, right? Right. And yeah. interestingly <laughs> enough, mm. all these end up being like again, the distinctions between what is a deterministic and what is volunteeristic gets really muddled as I break out these theories because mm. almost all of them are bits of both. It's what they think is the determining uh the determining factors that you're focusing on and trying to control because what what very few people think, um, except for Bernsteinist, okay, that there mm-hmm. there are the people who think this, is that just developing things as they are will lead to socialism. There mm-hmm. are some people who did. Um, I would say, interestingly, the the Bernsteinites, and to some degree, people who have deterministic views of Grossman, which I don't think he held himself. But hyper-deterministic views of Grossman will also come up with, basically, the crisis will make us socialize towards communism. And there will we don't have to do anything but wait until the crisis forces it upon us. There, right. you know, that kind of becomes, you know, you could think of it as Grossmanite accelerationism. Not, that's not something I think he believed at all. But no. that is something some people have deduced from him. Um Ted Reese, for example, uh, who I have disagreements with, but um, does not believe that. He does actually believe there will be a choice, but it is a choice. You could actually just choose to collapse society altogether. Um, uh, you know, but it, that is an option for him. You know, the the socialism or barbarism, or as he would phrase it, socialism or extinction question, the, the um, 
when when you think about the automatic socialist developments and the Bernsteinists, that even that question doesn't make sense because barbarism is not going to happen. Like it, th- this will, it basically makes socialism like the most Whiggish form of liberalism, if you believe that version. But not, very few people actually do, particularly right now. Um, well, I worry that the socialism or extinction choice will be pre- presented to us and we won't see it. Like maybe it's being presented to us now, but we don't have socialism is such a vaguely understood, th- mm-hmm. difficult concept that we don't have it. Correct. So what we have is like, you know, basically the choice is how do we neg- navigate this moment and avoid extinction? That's basically what we kind of feels like our our options are right now is avoid right. extinction, survive. Um, and I think that's a terrible place for socialists and Marxists to be in. It's just not Marxism at all. No, that's that – and yeah. uh, one thing I admitted, like like used to like about the communization theorists even when um, – is that they kind of admitted that, that they have jumped the shark of Marxism. <laughs> like, <laughs> But other right. groups that hold similar theory, as theories right now don't even realize that they do. Like this is mm. another problem. As we articulate these theories, these are the articulated and thought out versions of this. Most people, as I kind of implied by my statement about how, like, when you throw out the immiseration thesis and people j- just think you, you're all arguing about the same thing, they're not delineating which immiseration thesis, what are the conditions, what's actually being immiserated, etc. Or with, mm. with imperialism, is it overproduction or underproduction? Is it capital accumulation or getting rid of overproduction? These are different things, right? Yeah. And people go back and forth in their popular articulation about them. And, and, and this is a human trait. Like, you can complain about people doing this with God, like, you know, different concepts yeah. of God people move through that are mutually incompatible. It's mm-hmm. not, I'm not criticizing socialist as being unique in this. This is just human. Yeah, humans. I know. Yeah. But um, it is something we have to worry about because it means that, as you said, when presented with options, we don't even know what our pros and cons would be, much less how to make that choice. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, most people think socialism is social goods in a capitalist country. Um, mm-hmm. That is what socialism is to most people right now, which is part mm-hmm. of why it's popular. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it doesn't seem like, well, it's like Europe is socialist. And I'm like, well, yeah, but it isn't. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, you know, and right wingers love to play in that ambiguity. Um, themselves, because sometimes they'll accuse Canada of basically being like a solid dictatorship, and other times they'll rightly point out that, like, no, no, Norway's not really socialist. Like, they right. themselves will play with this ambiguity, mm-hmm. um, depending on what they're trying to rhetorically do, and they have an easier task. They're defending a part of the status quo, so, you know, they don't have to be consistent. But um, mm-hmm. we, 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 we look at this, this, um, voluntarism and and determinism problem and i think what you come to is like well a purely determined like you said a purely deterministic answer no one actually believes that because we wouldn't believe in politics a purely voluntaristic answer is kind of the david graber position i know people are gonna be mad at me for saying that but that's if we think another world is possible if we just believe it enough we Mm. can it is possible we don't have to but even he had a kind of prefigurative Right, right. He, he, well, and that made him a determinist, right? You know, like well, I mean, yeah. Well, except depends on again. It depends on when you read him. If you're reading him around Occupy, he's totally prefigurative. So much so that Occupy itself becomes the instantiation of right. the revolution. If you're reading him like before his death in the in the Graeber and Wingrove book, no, he doesn't. He clearly thinks this is a matter of well, we just have to have to ha- write ideology. And we will be able to structure ourselves this from that belief system, which is why he underplays theories of environmental interaction with ideology, which right. which is actually him arguing with Marx, because Marx Marx is also not a determinist or a volunteerist, and you know it because of his men don't make history. Uh, men make no, history I mean that's right. Own. He's so. I mean, I, well, the thing that convinced me about Marx is just that the way he, he does overcome. That the problem of the volunteerism determinism split in his explanation of capitalism and and the change from feudalism to capitalism, right? Kind of historical changes. 
you can see that the way we organize ourselves changes our interaction with nature, changes what's materially available to us um, in ways that we don't always even predict. It's right? a feedback loop for Marx, yeah. right? And yeah. so this gets us to the question of politics. Okay, let, let, look, let's break right here. Okay, let's stop here. We gotta, we gotta, we, we gotta, gotta we gotta, gotta we gotta, we gotta like make some money here. So if you want to hear anything more from us, <laughs> you have to go to Patreon, sign up, five dollars a month. You get to hear Derek and I talk. If you enjoyed this conversation please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.